Welcome to Melrose Unitarian Universalist Church. Our service today is called Cultivating Joy. So, good morning. I am the Reverend Dr. Suzanne Intrilligator. My pronouns are she and hers, and it is a joy to see your faces this morning and to be gathered in worship. Happy autumnal equinox. Uh, that's a mouthful. Today is one of the two days of the year when all the people all over the globe have equal days and equal nights, equal length days and equal length nights. The other one is the vernal equinox, the spring equinox. This marks the beginning of autumn in the northern hemisphere. Do you feel it? Can you feel it? Yeah? How many people are big fans of pumpkin latte and those kinds of things, those autumnal drinks? Not me. No, no. I like apple flavors. You guys like, you guys drink coffee? No, but I like coffee flavors. Still fans. They don't drink coffee, but they're still fans. I love colored leaves especially. Do you like colored leaves? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Our church is a vibrant, caring community dedicated to love and service. All who share our values are welcome here among us. If you're joining us for the first time, we have somebody who is, uh, who's playing the role of greeter this morning to answer all your questions. That would be Don Bissix. Don, where are you? He's out in the hallway saying hello to someone. <laughs> Good job, Don. Don, high five. Um, also, our usher today is Janice Bissix, who's sitting back there. So ask Don or Janice any of your questions. Um, a reminder from me quickly, I have open drop-in office hours every Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m. Just come on by and hit the buzzer on the parking lot door, the door off the parking lot. Um, and I'm also available to make appointments at other times. All you have to do is drop me an email. I'd love to hear from anybody or all of you about what happened over the summer or what's going on in your life now. So please do that. I'm also looking for ideas, ideas for our giving partners this year, our Giving Beyond Our Walls program. Next month, is uh, our theme is freedom. So if you, if you can think of a charity you'd like to support that aligns with freedom, I'd love to hear from you. A quick announcement from our new Director of Lifelong Religious Education, Rhea Brown-Bright. Good morning. We are still in search of volunteers, my friends, and volunteers are essential to this program. It's also a reminder that today is the volunteer pizza party for our RE volunteers after service at 12. So if maybe you've been considering being an RE volunteer and you really like pizza, there will be pizza, there will be information. This is to especially appreciate our folks who have been ongoing volunteers, but I would love to appreciate folks who are considering becoming volunteers. So I hope to see you at 12 in the supper room. Thanks. That sounds delicious. Um, and a quick announcement now from Lee Danielson, who is um, in our, our voting task group. Thanks, Lee. As uh, many of you know, part of the UU The Vote initiative is writing postcards on a nonpartisan partisan basis, encouraging everyone in the country to vote. So in June, Anne Easterbrooks and I, with some trepidation, ordered 1,000 postcards for this congregation to write. You all stepped up with writing in a really big way. And I'm happy to report that last week, Ann and I mailed out all 1,000 postcards to voters in Georgia. So Ann, who couldn't be here today, and I want to express our deep thanks to all of you who wrote, and to the anti-racism team for providing the stamps. Of course, there is still work to be done. So if you missed out or you want to write more postcards, um, we found another action group that does write postcards that was recommended to me. Uh, so see me uh, or Ann, or if you participate in the advocacy hour at the Climate Justice Revival next weekend, you can find out more about how to write postcards there. Thank you again. Thank you, Lee. 
I just want to add to that that there are also still 500 letters in my office that we wrote last year on behalf of Vote Forward. They requested they not be sent until October. So 1,500 is our grand total, which is something to be proud of. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention that Kathy Sang let me know that she is also doing some volunteering and um, in-person canvassing in New Hampshire. So if you're interested in that, you can see Kathy in Coffee Hour. She can give you some more information. And one last announcement, please, from Laura Spear on behalf of our climate justice team. Good morning, everyone. I am here this morning to encourage you all to come to the Climate Justice Revival next weekend. Over 350 congregations from around the country are coming together for this event. Here at MUUC, we'll have a workshop, coffee, lunch, and snacks on Saturday, September 28th from 9 to 2, and a worship service and advocacy hour on Sunday the 29th. What I love about this event is that I have been wanting something like this for years. I have been struggling in the face of the climate crisis to visualize a future where we can not only survive, but thrive. At our workshop, we will approach this topic in a whole new way and envision together a more hopeful future. That future we're going to reimagine will be something that works for everyone in our community, which is why it's called a climate justice event. This all ages event will be unlike any other climate change event. We'll have music and movement and joy, which is why it's called a revival. We're asking people to sign up so we can plan food and set up. And if you're a family and want to have your kid join us for either RE programming or have childcare, we really need you to sign up today. So I hope you'll join us next weekend. Dan Franklin and I are going to be the lead facilitators for this event. And we'll have Reverend Suzanne and Wendy and David Bliss and Jennifer as our co-facilitators. So if, come find us at Coffee Hour. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Exciting. I just want to mention that we now have an electronic order of service if you need one. It's available through this QR code that Bill's going to put on the screen. You can also access it through the worship reminder that's now in your email inbox. Or you can go to our website. At the top of the home page, there's a box about today's worship. If you hit the More button, it takes you to a page that has the whole order of service on it. There you go. Yes, please take out your phone and use the QR code. Now. It's time to welcome each other into worship. Please turn to your neighbor, both sides, front, back, around, wave to everybody, hug, shake hands. Good morning. It's a joy to see you. And hello to everyone uh, joining us at home on Zoom. I call us to worship this morning with a poem about joy from the great Sufi mystic Hafiz. He lived in the 1300s in Shiraz, Persia. His poetry gained international popularity in the 19th century, where it was beloved by Queen Victoria, Arthur Conan Doyle, Nietzsche, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who took to translating it. Our theme this month is the power of joy, so I've selected this, collect this from a collection called I Heard God Laughing. This poem by Hafiz is called The Great Secret. God was full of wine last night. So full of wine that he let slip a great secret. He said, there is no person on earth who needs a pardon from me. For there is really no such thing, no such thing as sin. The beloved has gone completely wild. He has poured himself into me. I am blissful and drunk and overflowing. Dear world, draw life from my sweet body. Dear wayfaring souls, come drink your fill of liquid rubies for God has made my heart 
an eternal fountain. Now we light the symbol of our faith, the flaming chalice. Here to do it for us this morning is an at-large member of our governing board, Kathy Sang. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning. This year, we are experimenting with some new options for our covenant space here in worship, trying different ways to express together our shared sense of purpose. Today, and for the next few weeks, we'll be trying out a covenant that is similar to the one that we've been using. Both are from the late 19th century. This one, written by Reverend James, Villa Blake is less theistic as it does not refer to God specifically. Now I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me as you feel comfortable. The words will appear on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Thank you. I invite you now to remain standing and join in our opening hymn, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. It's number 108 in the gray hymnal, but the words will appear here on the screen. is now the time if you'd like to come a little closer to see the story you can but also if you're comfy where you are you are welcome to stay there okay 
Today's story is called, Have You Filled a Bucket Today? And it has a little bit to do with joy. All day long, everyone in the whole wide world walks around carrying an invisible bucket. I know it's visible right now. <laughs> you can't see it, but it's there. You have a bucket, each member of your family has a bucket, your grandparents, friends, and neighbors all have buckets. Everyone carries an invisible bucket. Your bucket has one purpose only. Its purpose is to hold your thoughts and good feelings about yourself. You feel happy and good when your bucket is full, and you feel sad and lonely when your bucket is empty. Other people feel the same way too. They're happy when their bucket is full, and they're sad when their buckets are empty. It's great to have a full bucket, and, that, and this is how it works. Other people can fill your bucket, and you can fill theirs. You can fill your own bucket too. So how do you fill a bucket? You fill a bucket when you show love to someone, when you say or do something kind, or even when you give someone a smile. That's being a bucket filler. Are y'all bucket fillers? Yeah, good. A bucket filler is a loving and caring person who says and does nice things to make others feel special. When you treat others with kindness and respect, you fill their bucket. But you can also dip into a bucket and take out some good feelings. You dip into buckets when you make fun of someone, when you say or do mean things, or even when you ignore someone. Bullying is bucket dipping. When you hurt others, you dip into their bucket too. You will dip into your own bucket also. Many people who dip have an empty bucket. They may think they can fill their own bucket by dipping into someone else's, but will that work? No. You never fill your own bucket when you dip into someone else's. But guess what? What do you think is coming next? When you fill someone's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. You feel good when you help others feel good. All day long, we are either filling up or dipping into each other's bucket by what we say and what we do. Try to fill a bucket and see what happens. You love your grown-ups in your life? Why not tell them you love them? You can even tell them why. Have you ever told someone why you love them? I have. It's pretty great. Your caring words will fill their buckets with joy. Watch for smiles to light up their faces. You will feel like smiling, too. A smile is a good clue that you have filled a bucket. If you practice, you'll become a great bucket filler. Just remember that everyone carries an invisible bucket and think what you can say or do to fill it. When you're a bucket filler, you make your home, your school, and your neighborhood better places for all. Bucket filling makes everyone feel good. With that, the kids are wanna go to RE and we're wanna think about how to fill buckets and maybe make our invisible buckets real buckets. is when we take a deep breath together. Every Sunday at the, in the center of our worship service, we set aside time, time for quiet meditation, time for each of us to connect again with our inner selves, 
our highest ideals, our own individual sense of the divine, however it is that we understand it. Let's begin this time together by closing our eyes, if you like, breathing deeply, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your body settle into its seat, relaxing. Today in our meditation time, first we'll join in our centering song, then we'll sit for a time of shared quiet, then we'll share with one another our joys and sorrows, and then I will lead us in prayer. Our worship theme for September is the power of joy, and our centering song mentions that and ties it with themes of water. Please remain seated and join in the centering song as you like. Let it guide you gently into our time of shared quiet.
It is our tradition in worship every Sunday to share with one another the joys and sorrows of our lives, the personal milestones that mark our journeys in this life. I invite anyone who has a sorrow to share this morning to please come forward, speak from the mic so that everyone can hear you and see you. I invite people who are watching on Zoom to type a sorrow into the chat box now, and I will read it aloud. Thanks to everybody who shared joys. So let's light one more candle, please, Janice, as a symbol of all the joys that were shared and those that remain in our hearts today. Let the candle be for us a reminder of all the many blessings in our lives and a reminder to act on the gratitude we feel, share that joy around. Fill someone else's bucket. Thank you, Janice. For our prayer today, I have some words by the Reverend Eric Walker Wickstrom. Spirit of life, known by many names, yet by no name fully known. We gather today with hopes and dreams, and also with fears and wounds. May we be reminded that all things come and go, that today's joys and today's sorrows will in time give way to those of tomorrow, and that those of us who have strength to share today ought to do so while we can, and that those who are in need ought to allow ourselves to receive, for tomorrow those roles might well be reversed. Spirit of life, mother and father of us all, help us to remember those who are not here with us today those who need what we have found here, and those who have what we here need. May we always be open to growth and change, to movement, to grace. In the name of all that is holy, and in all the holy names that have ever been uttered, and those that have yet even to be imagined, let us say, blessed be, shalom, and amen. Our church is self-funded, supported by your generous annual pledge. You, you may also give to our weekly collection, which we split every month with a worthy group via our Giving Beyond Our Walls program. Remote folks can donate using the orange button at the top right corner of our homepage at melroseuu.org. In honor of the climate justice revival happening later this month, our climate action team has chosen the Friends of Wakefield's NEMT Forest to be our giving partner for September. The Friends are committed to protecting the remaining forested wetlands of the NEMT Forest and natural resources in the broader Wakefield area through collaboration, legislative, uh, legislation, and activism. Today for our anthem, we're gonna do something new for us. This one is called A New City of Joy by Joe Martin and Brad Nix.
Hooray for trying something new. That was great. Let's start with a reading, okay? In 2015, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, leader of Tibetan Buddhists, joined his old friend Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa for a series of conversations that they hoped would become a gift to the world. The talks were edited into a book called The Book of Joy, which became a bestseller. Last week's spiritual exercise came from that book. Today, our reading comes from the book. This is an excerpt. It's a little bit longer than readings are usually. It's about a page. It begins when the interviewer asks a very important question of the two spiritual leaders. How can people cultivate joy as a way of being? The archbishop immediately jumps in. He says, let me ask you, directly to his friend, the Dalai Lama, you've been in exile now, what, 50-something years? 56. 56 years in exile from a country that you love more than anything else. Why are you not morose? To answer, the book recounts the Dalai Lama's life quickly, and I think he did in the, in the moment too. At the age of two, when he was swept away from his family's one-room home in rural Tibet, recognized as the next Dalai Lama and shipped to a thousand-room palace in the capital city of Lhasa. That happened when the Dalai Lama was two. There he was raised in opulent isolation as the leader of Tibet and as a godlike incarnation of the Bodhisattva of compassion. Then, when the Chinese invaded in 1950, the Dalai Lama was thrust into politics. At the age of 15, he found himself the ruler of six million people and facing an all-out and desperately unequal war. For nine years, he tried to negotiate with communist China. But in 1959, during an uprising that risked inciting a massacre, the Dalai Lama decided with a heavy heart to go into exile. He left in the night dressed as a palace guard. He had to take off his recognizable glasses so his blurred vision must have heightened his sense of fear as the escape party snuck past garrisons of the People's Liberation Army. The group endured sandstorms and snowstorms as they summited 19,000-foot mountain peaks during their three-week escape across the Himalayas. The Dalai Lama said, one of my practices comes from an ancient Indian teacher he taught that when you experience some tragic situation, think about it. If there's no way to overcome the tragedy, then there is no use in worrying too much about it. So I practice that. He went on, many of us have become refugees, and there is a lot of difficulties in my own country. When I look only at that, then I do worry. But when I look at the rest of the world, there are also a lot of problems. And we realize that not only do we suffer, but so do many of our human brothers and sisters and cousins. The interviewer writes, here the Dalai Lama was not contrasting his situation with others, but uniting his situation with others, enlarging his own identity and seeing that he and the Tibetan people were not alone in their suffering. This recognition that we are all connected is the birth of empathy and compassion. Then another thing, the Dalai Lama continued, there are different aspects to any event. For example, we lost our own country and became refugees, but that same experience gave us new opportunities to see more things. Instead of being locked in the royal palace, I live here now. Personally, I prefer the last five decades of refugee life. It's more useful, there's more opportunity to learn and to experience life. Therefore, if you look from one angle, you feel, oh, how bad, how sad. But if you look from another angle at the same tragedy, the same event, you see that it gives new opportunities. So it's wonderful. That's the main reason that I am not sad and morose. There's a Tibetan saying, wherever you have friends, that's your country. And wherever you receive love, that's your home. Here ends our reading. So last week, I talked about how I was surprised by joy. 
surprised when the Harris campaign selected their themes of joy and freedom. Isn't joy frivolous, unserious, I thought? But then I watched and I researched and I meditated. And I began to see that joy is a great connector of people. And I found out that historically speaking, joy has proven to be a potent tool that undercuts authoritarians. It came back to me today when we were singing, you know, when tyrants hear the bells of freedom ringing, how can I keep from singing? I saw joy working over these last couple months, unleashing that great wave of energy among tired, tired people. And I realized that I myself had been stuck, kind of frozen in crisis mode these last several years. And joy woke me up. So I chose joy as the theme for September and freedom as our theme for October, because they're not just political slogans, they are our spiritual concepts, important spiritual concepts, and I figured they're going to be on our minds anyway, so they were worth our time and attention here in worship. So this week, I'm talking about how to cultivate joy. In our culture, there's this widespread perception that joy is something that happens to us, and it's momentary and fleeting. And that can be true, but it can also be something more like a choice, an orientation, a lifestyle, which is why I started with this story about the Dalai Lama. Here we have someone who has had to endure so much. Talk about authoritarian rulers. He was a leader of a nation that was overrun, stolen. He lost his homeland, his people, his calling. Or did he? Did he reinvent his calling? The Dalai Lama could have been devastated, destroyed by what happened, but he chose not to be. He says that when you experience tragedy, if there's no way to overcome it, then there's no use worrying about it. When things are beyond your control, sometimes you just have to let them go. And it's such an important spiritual lesson. I realize, I think on some level, I somehow liked worrying about this upcoming election. It gave me the illusion that I had some kind of control over it. <laughs> that by worrying about it, I was actually doing something about it. But I, I wasn't. All I was doing was making myself miserable, and that spilled over onto people around me. Instead of spreading joy, filling other people's buckets, the one area where I do have actual influence, I was spreading anxiety. So I decided to stop doing that to the best of my ability. I also love the Dalai Lama's example of seeing your own suffering as connected to all others, which leads to compassion, which then also leads to joy. There's this remarkable thing about the Book of Joy. I first encountered it as an audio book. I got it from the library and I was listening to it and all through it, you can hear the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop making fun of each other, <laughs> like school children. They're giggling, they're hugging, they're holding hands. The archbishop keeps making jokes about his big nose. These people are world leaders under immense pressure. They're both survivors of brutal regimes and political repression, and both choose to live in joy, to spread joy as much as they can to the best of their ability. It reminds me of that famous quote by Viktor Frankl. He was, of course, a psychotherapist who survived the Holocaust, and his, favorite, his famous book is Man's Search for Meaning, and in it he wrote, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. He also said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think the Archbishop and the Dalai Lama ex exemplify this, that no matter what, you can choose joy, that spreading joy can be a, an orientation, a lifestyle even. And if they can do it, why not me? I'm working on it. When she was first starting out as a designer, a woman named Ingrid Fattel Lee got offended she tells this story in a TED talk she has. One of her professors in design school commented that her design projects brought him joy. At first, Ingrid took this as an insult. 
She thought that he meant that it was frivolous, unserious, unworthy. But then she decided to dig in to find out what he meant and why. So Ingrid, as she says in the TED Talk, decided to become a detective of joy. She spent the next 10 years asking everyone she met, strangers included, people in airports, what brings you joy? And she found out that joy wasn't unpredictable or fleeting or even idiosyncratic, that there were patterns to it. So that's why I chose this. This is Ingrid's image. She said people told her things like cherry blossoms, bubbles, swimming pools, tree houses, hot air balloons, googly eyes, fireworks. She calls them universal sparkers of joy. They cut across lines of age and gender and ethnicity. She says, in this polarized world where it feels like our differences are insurmountable, it turns out that many of us find joy in exactly the same things. It can remind us of our shared humanity, our common experience of the physical world. So she decided to put up these photos in her studio and to study them for years. And finally, it dawned on her, what do they have in common? She discovered a set of patterns that she developed into what she calls the aesthetics of joy. The patterns are round things, symmetrical shapes, pops of bright color, a sense of abundance or multiplicity, feelings of elevation or lightness. She began to seek out other designers who were using these elements in their work, people who were building in joy, transforming drab environments like offices, hospitals, schools, public housing, making them into landscapes of joy. She says there are evolutionary reasons for this pattern, these patterns, that neuroscience now backs up her theories. For example, angular objects in nature, like thorns and horns, signify danger to our brains, and they light up the fear centers the, in the amygdala. But curves are actually quite calming, according to neuroscience, and that's why round shapes bring us joy. Similarly, our brains evolve to delight in a sense of abundance. Say when our ancestors discovered a, a berry bush covered in ripe berries, it set off our joy senses. So we like multiplicity, which is why I chose this dress to wear today. It's my joy dress. Polka dots apparently bring joy. The point is that we can choose joy, no matter the circumstance. We can learn to recognize it in daily life. We can even learn to build it into daily life. And it will help us to become stronger and more resilient and more effective, not to mention happier and healthier. There's some research from the Institute of Neuroscience at the University of Glasgow that suggests, according to them, there are only four fundamental human emotions, three of which are the so-called negative emotions, fear, anger, and sadness. The only positive one is joy or happiness. So exploring joy is nothing less than exploring what makes human experience satisfying. Last, night, last week I mentioned Ross Gay, who studies joy. He's a poet and essayist, and I shared a reading from him. This week I want to share this quote. He says, in our speaking about and for justice, we often forget to advocate for what we love, for what we find beautiful and necessary. We are good at fighting, but imagining and holding in one's imagination what is wonderful and to be adored and preserved and exalted is far harder for us to do. But it is so very worth it. I got one last story that kind of exemplifies the power of joy, these many powers of joy. When the great composer Beethoven was just 15 years old, he read a poem that changed his life. It was published in a popular magazine, and it was written by the German historian Friedrich Schiller. It was called Ode to Joy. 
Retelling this story, the contemporary writer Maria Popova describes the poem as, quote, a blazing manifesto for the enlightenment ethos that if freedom, justice, and human happiness are placed at the center of life and made its primary devotion politically and personally, then peace and kindness would envelop humankind as an inevitable consequence. Schiller called the poem a kiss for the whole world. And Popova writes, the teenage Beethoven longed to be the lips of the possible. <laughs> For 27 years, Beethoven struggled to put the poem to music. While the Napoleonic Wars waged across Europe, and thousands of people lost their lives and their livelihoods. While Napoleon's armies occupied Vienna, where he lived. While Beethoven lost his hearing and suffered terrible headaches that had no cure. While his deafness made him antisocial and irritable and lonely, Beethoven suffered. His love went unrequited, his brothers died. Through it all, he kept struggling with that poem. It had never been done before. No major composer had ever scored vocal parts into a symphony. How would it even work? One autumn day in 1822, Beethoven was so full of ideas, so ferociously engaged in his creative process, that he went out for a quick morning stroll in the city without his hat or his coat. He lost track of time and place and hours later ended up far out in the countryside. And he was so dirty and disheveled that the local police arrested him for suspicious behavior. In the jail cell, he raged all day long and all the way up until midnight. When finally the, the police, he had convinced them to go and wake up a local music conductor who could verify that he was indeed the great Beethoven. <laughs> he got out of jail at midnight. What I love about this story is that in the midst of great suffering, Beethoven focused on joy. He struggled for so many years because he wanted, like the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop, to give the world a gift of joy. A joy that might help us unite around shared values like freedom and justice and human happiness. And of course, like the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop, Beethoven succeeded. His great and final Symphony No. 9 builds toward the fourth and final movement, which erupts with the choral masterpiece the world now knows as the Ode to Joy. Critically acclaimed and immensely popular around the world, some of people think of it as the very first pop song, and maybe still the greatest. Popova calls Beethoven's crowning, it calls it Beethoven's crowning achievement of his crowning achievement. It's the official theme of the European Union, it has been used to celebrate the fall of the Berlin Wall, used as a protest song by freedom fighters in Chile and Tiananmen Square and the Ukraine. For 200 years now, Beethoven's triumph over suffering, his transcendent joy still unites and inspires people all over the world. And I'm still learning from him and people like him and the designer Ingrid Lee that joy isn't super as some superfluous extra. She says, the drive toward joy is itself the drive toward life. When we choose to cultivate joy, we are choosing resilience and strength, compassion and connection. We are choosing to care for ourselves and our loved ones and all of the people we see in our daily lives. In choosing joy, we are choosing life. So may it be, let us rise in body or in spirit and join in our closing hymn, which is, of course, number 29 in our gray hymnal, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. The words are not Schiller's words. They are from Henry Van Dyke, but the tune is all Beethoven. Please enjoy.
Thank you. Please remain standing and join with me in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen. Mic over here, Bill. I know I'm moving around too much for you. Our worship is concluded. Thank you for joining in. Thank you to the people are, who are at home. Please feel free to join us for a coffee hour in Parish Hall, right across the hall, down this way. Um, and there are several meetings that go on after church. Thanks for being here, and happy Sunday. Mm -hmm.